So I want you to look at this word, uh, solipsism, and I don't know if you know what it means. It's a philosophical idea. And it's really great. I think it def defines us too much. And it means that only what is in your mind, your mind is the only thing that exists. And therefore, you can only know the world with what's in your mind. And that's what solipsism is. And that's good because that takes care of three billion of you, the haves. And so we're, we're talking about nine, and I'm going to have to come clean. There's three that I just don't care about. And that's you, sorry. Um, because I really worry about the other six. And since they aren't in our mind in an affluent society, and we don't see them, they don't exist. And so I'm going to prove to you today that you want to spend a lot of time thinking about what doesn't exist in an affluent society. Because if you don't take care of those six billion with the right flavor of energy, you will all be doomed and you'll die. And the last speaker's plot will go to zero. But there'll be large cockroaches still. Yay. So um, let's start on this little journey of understanding why we need to worry about six billion people. And this idea of solipsism has everything to do with energy. So I can calculate, and have done so, the world's entire energy use. And you don't need to be a scientist to do it. You just need to know three numbers and have Google at your fingertips. So if I look up and estimate what a world population will be, so the number is nine, that's what we'll use for today, because you all use energy. As a matter of fact, I can calculate how much energy you use, right? Because you take in the number of calories, and that's over a 24-hour period, so I can make that into power. What's power, energy per unit time? Wattage. So if I calculate how the average intake of calories over 24 hours, guess how bright you are as a light bulb? You're only a 100-watt light bulb. Since you're here, maybe you're 110 watts. You're a little brighter <laughs> than everybody else. Um, and then we got to start putting around your 100 watts, which is all you need to exist, the other energy, because you manufacture, you like driving nice cars. And that has to do with gross domestic product per capita. So if I know the GDP, how wealthy a country is per person, I can take that number, multiply it by population, and then the last number is conservation. That's called energy intensity. So say I have a GDP and I grow an economy to some number, if next year I can hit that same GDP or wealth and use less energy, I've conserved energy. And that's quantifiable. So when people talk about conservation and it sounds hand wavy, it's not. I can calculate how well you're conserving. And so if you multiply all that stuff together, you're going to get your energy used. And you can see I'm a technocrat. I'm a scientist. So I'm only one piece of the equation. If you don't have the sociology piece, population and humanities piece, and you don't have the business piece and economics piece and law piece, you can't have a full energy equation. So <clears throat> I can calculate energy. I did. You guys are 16. So what's 16 terawatts? So right now, the world has a 16 trillion watt light bulb on. So if I take the, I go on Google, take all the GDPs per capita population, and make an estimation about energy intensity, conservation, I calculate you're, you have a 16 trillion watt light bulb on, and you're keeping it lit, and you're doing it with mostly coal oil gas. You already know that. That's how you keep the light bulb on. In 2050, the target date of this conference, you're going to need 16 more. 
and I can calculate that too because I can just assume a growing world population, 9 billion. I'll assume economic growth at 2.3% per year globally. That's been the case forever. And then I'll make another energy intensity argument in a second. So you have 16 and you need 16 more. Big deal, 16 isn't a big number. But let me give you a few ideas. If I took the entire face of the planet and put the fastest growing crops on it and used it just for energy, you get six. If I build nuclear power plants, one every 1.5 days forever, because you have to decommission power plants every 50 years and rebuild them. If you built nuclear power plants at one gig, one gigawatt, you don't build them for bigger, it's dangerous, forever to maintain a base load of nuclear of eight terawatts, you would have to build one every day and a half. So now all of a sudden, 16 is not looking so great. Wind, forget it. Anything you can put your hand through this easily, don't use it as your energy source. All right? If you have it, use it. But believe me, you're not going to get 16 terawatts out of wind, no matter who tells you from what school. So... What did I assume? There's one thing I had to make an assumption is about conservation. I assumed that every bit of energy you use today, you're going to save in 50 years. So this part of the world, the haves who are using most of the energy, I said you're good people and you're going to save 16 terawatts of energy for me. And you still need 16 more. And you know why from the last talk. It's because of the six billion we solipsistic individuals don't see. So the growing world population in Africa, rural China, large parts of India, Southeast Asia, that's what's driving your energy needs for the future, not you. And so then what you need to do is worry about these six billion, and it has to do with how do I get them energy cheaply and in a distributed way. And hence, the title of my talk was one times six billion. So can I make an energy supply, give it out to everybody, and then have all six billion people use it and uh, live renewably? <clears throat> Why am I saying it has to be lightweight and manufacturable? So look what I did. Here's another Google experiment. You, now I'm gonna tell you what professors do. Nothing. We sit at our desk and we order students around. And so then they go and do research, and then <clears throat> we are who we are. So I'm not like that. I did an experiment, and I went on Google, and I do Google plots. And then I run into the lab and say, guys, look what I just discovered. And then as you're getting older, your students pat you on the head. They bring you back to your office. They say, go back inside and let us keep doing real work. So I'm going to show you their real work in a minute. But in the meantime, since they won't listen to me and you're here, you're going to have to. So here's my Google plot. And so what I did is I said, look at this. I don't care about what type of technology. I just said, how much does it weigh and how much did it cost to make? So I went on Google, a Boeing 777 costs so much, and I divided it by weight. And then I did it for etching tools, machine tools, and automobiles, and I got a curve. Yay, that's good for scientists. Um, <clears throat> what doesn't it work for? Pills. Because you guys, you're Americans, a lot of you, you believe dying is an option, right? If I pay enough money, Somehow I won't die. So you'll pay anything for the magic pill to keep you living. So that doesn't work. Um, commodity chemicals don't work. Intel chips don't work. But things you manufacture work this way. And so what that says, look at the lower limit. You can never be cheaper than $10 per pound. Now you could say, uh, automobile, Boeing 777. I'm saying this works for anything that's highly manufacturable. This is true. I called them, and I found out how much the burger weighed, the cheese, the bun, the tomato, and the lettuce. It comes out at $10 per pound. Now you know their profit margin on the quarter pounder. Um, how do you guys build energy? 
You don't build energy like that. You build energy like this. You build one big thing. It weighs a lot. You multiply by $10 per pound, and that comes out to a large number, $1.5 billion. So if you want to have energy in this part of society, I have what's called a capital expenditure. I have to have the money to build it. Then at $1.5 billion, I now own the energy. I centr I'm centralized. I, just, I give it to you guys. I collect money back to cover my $1.5 billion investment and make a profit. Why don't 6 billion people in the future have energy? Thank goodness, because we would build it that way. They don't have money for a capital expenditure. So that has saved us as a planet that the poor couldn't invest in our misguided ways of energy. But we need to get energy to the poor, so how will you do it? And so we're simple-minded. If that side of the graph doesn't work, turn your eyes to the other side. So my greatest aspiration in life was to build the McDonald's hamburger of energy. All right, so that's what I'm gonna tell you right now quickly. Let me describe it a different way to give you an idea of this market model of energy. If McDonald's sold hamburgers the way we build energy systems, they would make one huge hamburger that you would all drive to and take a bite out of it. Okay, that's how we build energy now. So we decided, could we build an energy system that looks like a hamburger? So where will our energy system be? I'm going to give you a hint. She follows you. Everybody that sees her smiles at her, and she talks to you every time you feel her on you, saying, use me, use me. Have you guessed yet? Do you know in one hour she puts out more energy than you use in an entire year globally? And you guys aren't using it. Now it's not a 100-watt bulb anymore. You're starting to dim on me as a society. So it's the sun. So that's a true statistic. In one hour, she puts out more energy than we're using globally. So how do you go from the left to the right? There is a model. I have no friends anymore. People don't like me. People don't, but I have lots of friends. When you don't have a lot of people liking you, you choose something that's around and everywhere, leaves. I walk around Harvard's campus talking to leaves all the time, and they talk back to me. So how does a leaf work? You take sunlight. The leaf takes sunlight, and it splits sunlight, water, H-O-H, H2O, to hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is a high-energy fuel in the day. At night, hydrogen combines with CO2 and makes biomass, sugars, carbohydrates. That's what you think about, but that's a nighttime project for the leaf. During the day, the leaf is harnessed energy, and when it's harnessed the energy, it's harnessed solar energy and rearranging the bonds of water to make hydrogen and oxygen, and you have stored sunlight then that you can use whenever you need it, not just when the sun is out. So we set out to do that. That's the artificial leaf. I don't want to tell you too much about it. I'm a scientist. What did Bill Murray tell you guys in Ghostbusters? Back off. I'm a scientist. It's my job to figure this stuff out, so I did with my students. We made catalysts that we could put on silicon. When light comes into it, it separates charge, but now we don't send it into wires like you do on your roof. We send it to special catalysts we made, and the catalyst split water to make hydrogen and oxygen, just like the leaf. So you can play the movie, so there it goes. That's just sitting on my window, so I don't do anything more at Harvard anymore. I just drop these things in water and just watch them bubble all day. The front side is oxygen. On the back side, the electrons, when you charge, separate in silicon, they went to the back side, and then they get collected by the other part of the water splitting reaction, and you make hydrogen. And you, by the way, we won a film, Sundance Film Festival. Uh, we won a prize. You can go look at the Sundance Film Festival to figure out how it works. I told you I wanted to be a hamburger. It's a hamburger. 
The silicon is the hamburger. The cheese, we have to protect the silicon because when you make O2 plus silicon, that makes sand, SiO2. And then we put a top bun catalyst, bottom bun catalyst. I made a hamburger. My hamburger, though, makes hydrogen. What will you do with hydrogen? You'll blow up balloons. Yay, that's what you'll do with it. You don't know what to do with hydrogen. So I make, and my group does this really neat thing, but you have no infrastructure. That delays technology adoption. So in the last year and a half, I'm giving you a real updated version here, with my colleague Pam Silver in Harvard Medical School, we took a little bacteria, and there's this new or field that's the rage called synthetic biology. We know so much about genes, we can insert genes into things. So we inserted a gene into the bug to have a nose, and it breathes in hydrogen. It literally breathes in the hydrogen from the artificial leaf. It's called a gene for hydrogenase. It's not a real nose. It's an enzyme. So it breathes in hydrogen. Then we inserted genes that take the hydrogen plus the CO2, the bugs breathe in from the atmosphere, and they make long-chain biomass and liquid fuels. So we're doing that now, and now you know how to use that infrastructure. So there it is. You could use a fuel cell with hydrogen, but you've decided not to. So rather than fighting City Hall, uh, we've done even more science, and now we can make liquid fuels depending on what gene sequence we put in there, or biomass depending on what genes. And look at these numbers, not published yet. You're getting the preview. 11% biomass efficiencies. 7% liquid fuel. Why are those numbers important? The fastest growing plants on the face of the planet, 1%. So we're doing better than nature by 10% now. So that's important because I told you you only get six terawatts from the fastest growing 1% plants. So now we've really upped the number. So to end, I just want to tell you, you can't have, and I hope I've convinced you, you can't have a world that looks like that. When people talk about economic, uh, environmental sustainability, integrity, they think about the planet, and the part they're forgetting is the people person, you. And if you don't get the poor the right flavor of energy, and they use your energy, this planet will be in deep, deep trouble. And perhaps who said it best was Kurt Vonnegut, just before he died, I was on stage with him once, or with him, and he said to me, you know, I always listen to you scientists, and you always worry about the, the planet, the planet, the planet, planet, and know what he said? He said, stop talking about that, because she's wonderful, and she has an immunological response system, and like any organism, when she gets really annoyed at us, she'll just kill us. She's going to be just fine. So when you get really depressed, that's solipsism. When you think about a planet, you think it's you. It's not you. And if you don't do the right thing for that one little person times six billion, Kurt Vonnegut's forecast of the future might come true. So thank you very much. Thank you.